All right, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. I will um, keep letting people in as they arrive, but I want to give our speaker um, all the time she needs to uh, teach everyone here about um, data visualization in R. So welcome to the second meetup of um, the Our Lady St. Louis uh, 2020 to 2021 um, workshop series. And tonight we're going to do an introduction to data visualization with ggplot2. Uh, the materials you need for tonight, and I'm sure these will be also in the slide and in the materials, uh, if you haven't seen them already, are these four R packages. Tidyverse, Patchwork, ggrepel, and ggforce. Let me put those in the chat in case that would help. So those are in the chat if you need them after I move the slide. So just a short background on Our Ladies. This is a worldwide organization to promote gender diversity in the R community. It started in 2012 and it currently has 174 chapters around the world with more than 73,000 members. Uh, our chapter started in 2017 here in St. Louis. And that is a picture you probably can't um, find me, but I'm in there somewhere. Uh, that is a picture last February when we could still go places with lots of people. Um, that's everybody at the R Studio Conference who is also a part of the Our Ladies community. Uh, Our Ladies St. Louis was started by me and my friend Chelsea in 2017. We started having four or five meetups a year um, in the first three years, 2017 to 2020. And this year we're gonna have four just in fall alone and hopefully seven or eight for the entire year. Um, my co-organizers for 2021, and I saw a couple of them here uh, tonight are Mary Painter of the University of Missouri, Shelley Cooper of Wash U, and Crystal Lewis also of the University of Missouri. Uh, our 2020, 2021 schedule started with uh, data cleaning last month. And then today we're gonna do some data visualization. In November, we have an intro to network analysis. And then in December, we have an intro to Shiny. So if you have interest in any of those, you can look for more information on Meetup. Uh, we'll send out Zoom links as we get closer to each of those events. Uh, we are currently recording, and so if you do not want your uh, face or voice to be on the recording, you can just turn off your camera and your microphone and you will not show up. We've set it so that only people whose cameras are on will show uh, at all in the video. So um, you can turn those off and then feel free if you'd like to, to use the chat to ask questions either to everyone or uh, you can ask them directly to me and I will convey them to uh, the speaker for the evening. Okay, uh, so if you want to learn more about Our Ladies St. Louis or Our Ladies just in general, um, you can go to the Our Ladies website uh, to learn about the mission and the global work that we're doing. Uh, if you want to um, tweet at us or to us or connect with us, there are three ways to do that. Uh, the Twitter handle is probably the easiest way to get at least my attention. Um, but now that there are four of us working on this, we also are checking the Gmail more often uh, and checking the questions we get on Meetup. So any of those ways, if you want to get involved, if you want to be a speaker, if you want to suggest a speaker or a sponsor, any of those things would be great. Um, and now for tonight's main feature, uh, we have Minakshi, who is currently in Taiwan, where it is 8.30 in the morning, um, which is different from where I am, where it's pretty late in the evening. Uh, she is an MPH from the University of Washington from 2015 and has worked on environmental health projects. Um, and you can see some of the topics for those. She currently directs research at ILK Labs and uh, her bio with a lot more detail is on our meetup page if you have interest in what she's doing. Um, it, I always learn a lot about what kinds of data science jobs are out there from um, the speakers at these meetups. So she's got some more information on there. Uh, and I am going to turn it over to Meenakshi so she can teach you all about data visualization. So I will stop sharing and let you take it away. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Harris, for the kind introduction. Um, I will share my screen now. Please let me know in the chat or just, you know, um, give me a holler if you're not able to hear me or if I say I'm sharing something and you are not able to see it because I'll be switching between my slides and the practice exercises. Uh, so, the sharing started. Okay, are you able to see my screen now? Yes. Okay. So this is the first time I'm using two screens. So if you see my face, it's a weird, at a weird angle because I'm just looking at a second screen. Uh, so. All right. And I'll try to look at the chat here just from time to time. Okay. Um, thank you everyone for being here. It's my honor to present at the Our Lady St. Louis chapter. I myself have benefited from previous talks of your chapter and you know learned a lot. So I hope this time is uh, useful for you. So in today's session, we are going to cover, uh, start from the beginning of some theory of ggplot2. Uh, go through some examples, all the components, and uh, if we have time, we'll look at some extensions that you can apply to your plots um, beyond ggplot. Um, the exercises, uh, you can go through them, uh, you can just mute me and go through them on your own, the instructions are there, or else um, I will work, since we have only two hours, I will work through the exercises here, so I'll live code. Um, and you can look at them at the in the recorded video later, or I'll also upload the solutions um, um, uh, solutions on the same uh, my GitHub repo after the talk. Okay. All right. So the ggplot, the gg in ggplot stands for grammar of graphics, which you may already know. Um, so grammar of graph graphics is not just a pop culture phrase. It actually comes from this book from Leland Wilkinson, who wrote about theory of graphs in 1999. And this, like this theory then, um, is now a foundation for many graphic applications. Um, this grammar can be applied to every type of plot, and what, uh, so instead of thinking of plots as, you know, separately like box plot, scatter plot, line plot, you think of them, all of them as different forms of a graphic, um, which is based on certain rules, just like we have grammar and language. Those rules help us talk or write or um, generate content, similar to that, a grammar of graphics. Um, so we'll, uh, we will work through all the components of that grammar. And once understanding this theory helps us construct plots. And also when you see new plots, you know, deconstruct it. Like if I see a box plot and I, if I use the grammar of graphics, it's easier to then for me to reproduce it if I can break it down into components. So the major idea, like you said, is decompose graphics into its constituents. Um, and on the right side is what are all the co constituents that we will go through. Um, uh, don't worry if you have not seen them before, we'll take time to go through them one by one and work through examples. Okay. So your first component of any plot is data. Data is what you are plotting, your data frame, uh, your data set. Um, it's 
it's very important and there are things to know about it you know how to read your data how to clean up your data it is best if your data is in a tidy format um, tidy means uh, every column is a variable and every row is an observation so it's really important but we won't be going through that in this talk um, the, because there's just too much to talk about on that um, so your first component is data Second is mapping. What does mapping mean? mean? This is how we tell our which variables we want to plot. Say you have, a, we'll be working through that in the exercises, um, MPG data set, which has information about cars. So my columns are, uh, you know, mileage, car type, car um, manufacturer. How does the how does R know which variables, which columns do I want to use in plotting? Um, what is for X? What stands for X and what stands for Y? And uh, what should we use for color? So whenever we are talking about what columns or what variables from your data uh, you want to show up in the plot, what relationships you want to show in your plot, that is what we mean by mapping. Uh, mapping can be two types. One is the aesthetic mapping, where you're linking these columns to the graphical properties. Um, and the second is facets mapping, where we, uh, where we link the variable in the data or the columns in the data to different panels in the plot. This will be more clear when we talk about facets later. Next is st statistics. So um, even if your data is super clean, it's tidy data, it may need some transformation. Um, what do I mean by transformation? So you may have seen it already if you plot you know, a histogram. Uh, when you plot a histogram, even if you don't give the bin size, um, your uh, R or any other software will generate the bin size directly. It will use some default. When you use a box plot, uh, when you draw a box plot, the box plot shows your median, your uh, percentile. So those are, that is information that are, is probably not present in your data set, but R or the plotting software used some stats to generate that. So any computation that your plot, um, your software does, that's what we mean by statistical transformation or stats. Um, you don't have to always specify it. Most of the times it is implicit in many plots and uh, R uses defaults, but you can always customize it. Okay. Um, next is scales. Uh, you're probably familiar with it. Um, it helps you, helps you interpret the plot. For example, if you have categories, which color should, you, uh, should the categories be assigned to? You know, male, female, red, blue. Um, if you have numerics on X and Y axis, which position should they be in? Um, it is automatically generated in ggplot and again, can be customized. You don't have to always specify it. Um, some examples where you may want to specify them is if you're using a log scale, if you're using a time series. So you tell you know X, X axis is years or X axis is for hours. Next is geometries. Geometries are uh, really how you represent your data on the plot. And we know geometries by how we define plots. So box plot has a box plot geometry, a line plot has a line, line geometry, a bar chart has a bar geometry, a scatter plot has a point geome geometry, but the scatter plot uh, we call it scatter plot instead of point plot because now that is just popular, but technically it has a point geometry. So it determines what your plot type is. Okay. Um, next is facets. So facets is how, uh, if you want to divide your data into panels of one or two groups. So if I have my data, if I have gender in my data and I want to divide it into groups of gender, I can do that with panels. So it basically divides your plot into smaller subsets. So you can look at, um, avoid over plotting and just look what is happening in each group. Okay, 
coordinates. So most of the time we don't have to worry about coordinate systems, but if you're drawing space, if you're working with spatial data or if you're plotting wind rows and environmental data, then this becomes more important. It's, it's good to be aware of it. Um, it's good to be aware of it that um, default coordinate system in ggplot is the Cartesian coordinate system where you have the X and Y independent axis and you can always change them um, if you have another specific plotting um, purpose. Okay. And themes. Um, so finally, theme is how your plot looks like overall, you know, whether I have a white background or a black background, what are my major axis, um, major and minor axis look like. Basically, it is your overall look of the plot, which does not depend on your data. So it is, this is independent data. Um, you can, it's also called, you know, non-data ink in print. So all your ink, which is not related to data and maybe just for, um, aesthetics or the look of your plot. So again, um, ggplot comes with default theme, themes and you can always change and customize them. All right, so that was the theory. Thank you for staying with me. I know theory can be a bit dry. Um, how do we use all of these, all of these components now to build a data masterpiece or your ggplot? So we'll dive into that. Now, all right. So if you have um, your tidyverse package loaded already, that's great. If you don't, you can use it, load it using the library tidyverse uh, command. This is how you load any package. And if it is your first time, you may need to install the package first. So install packages, tidyverse and library and then load it using the library command. Okay, so we'll start with a question which can be answered from one of the data sets in these packages. Um, do cars with big engines use more fuel than cars with small engines? All right. Okay, so we will use the data set MPG uh, which is in your tidy included in your tidyverse package. So you don't have to worry about loading the data from somewhere else right now. The MBG dataset is um, has information um, about cars uh, collected by US Environmental Protection Agency. It includes 38 models of cars. And if you just do um, head, which um, use the he head function, on NPG, you in the first six rows of your, uh, you can see the first six rows of your data set. Um, if you have not seen this kind of function before, I could have just used, used head MPG, but by specifying ggplot2 double colon MPG, I'm making sure that I'm reading the data set within the ggplot2 package um, and not a local copy of something else. So this part is optional. You could just do head NPG, head in bracket NPG. So let's look at the data set. Uh, we have these columns that are variables. So we have the manufacturer, um, model of the car, displacement, which is a measure of the engine size, year, um, cycles, um, transmission, drive, mileage in the city, mileage on the highway, and class. So the main two variables um, that we'll be working with is um, displacement, which is which talks, uh, which tells you about the car's engine size, and highway, um, car's fuel efficiency on the highway in miles per gallon. So if a car, car is more fuel efficient, it will use less fuel. If it is less efficient, it will use more fuel. Um, if you want to learn about the data set or if you want to learn about any other function that we're using, just type a question mark and the object that you want to learn about. So if you type 
question mark MPG, more documentation will show up and you can read in detail about it. All right, so your first GG plot. So let's see, these um, on the right, uh, I'm doing some sequential plot presentations. So we'll be adding components to it. Um, to the code sequentially so that it show up on the screen sequentially, but there are different ways of writing the same thing and I'll talk to you about it. So you see the first function is just ggplot. Um, I'm telling R that the data is MPG um, and we don't, we, we have a black canvas, it doesn't do anything. All right, um, now I have added in AES, which stands for, for aesthetics, X equal to displacement. So I'm basically telling R my X axis will be the displacement um, column, so which is the engine size. So as you do this, your X axis appears here. And then I tell Y equal to highway. So Y, uh, y axis is highway mileage. So I've given the data, I've given the X and Y columns. So remember aesthetics inside AES, what you tell are whatever columns you want to use for your data. But I still don't have any plot here. What I have is just a canvas with a border of an X and Y axis. So R is waiting for you to tell what geometry you want to use. Remember, do you want to, do you want to use line? How do you want to represent your observations? Do you want to... Um, um, do you want to show them by points? So that's what we will add. Add your geometry by function geom point. And now you have a scatter plot. All right. So this is your first GG plot. That's all you need. Let's go through what did we need there. Uh, from all the components that we talked about, we talked about eight components. We needed your, the data, which is MPG. Um, we needed to specify the mapping, which is what, what co columns from your data set do you want to map on your plot? So we said highway and cycle, um, sorry, highway and displacement and the geometry. So this is the minimum that you need for your ggplot. Your data, your mapping, your geometries. All other components use defaults. So you saw, so we didn't have any st statistics there, but scales, it just assigned a scale to X and Y axis. It assigned the Cartesian coordinate system. And we had, we had a theme with a gray background. So R chooses, ggplot use, chooses a lot of defaults for you, which makes sense, but they may not always work for you. So you can, customize them and we learn later how to customize them one by one. Okay, so if we want to convert what we did to a template that you can just use later for any type of plot, this is something that you can use. Um, so you need a ggplot function, specify data, your data set in there, and then a geom function which is we use geom um, point in which inside the AES aesthetics, you talk, uh, you tell R which columns do you want to map, all right? So this is another way in which we could have written our code, um, ggplot, data equal to mpg, geom point, you are providing your geom function. So with different geometries, this, second will change. So geom point, geom line, geom box plot. And then inside mapping, inside AES, we tell x equal to displacement and y equal to highway. So this is a temp template that you, you can use to draw any plot in ggplot. And, and throughout this talk now, we are going to build on this template. All right, so um, before we go ahead, there's just some cautions. Uh, as you start typing code, maybe you've been to coding for a while, there's some problems that always occur. And so this is just flagging them so that, uh, you know, 
you can look out for them. All of this stuff that I've listed here, it happens to me all the time. So, you know, I write code that doesn't work. And, and then, you know, you look through it and you read it again, and then maybe you figure out how, what was wrong. So here are some aids for that. Make sure that every uh, parenthesis, the bracket is matched with another uh, bra bracket, a closing bracket. So you don't have a um, loaner parenthesis um, dangling and your code will not work if that's, if you, if you have open brackets. Um, same thing with uh, quotation marks. So if you're, def uh, you know, using proper nouns to say, define color or shape or something, make sure that every quotation mark is paired with a closing mark. And this one, which may not be very obvious, make sure that your plus sign is in the right place. It has to come at the end of the line, not the start. So for example, the following code will not work. So uh, one thing I didn't mention explicitly was in ggplot, you can add components to your plot by using the plus sign. So that's great. You know, you can add, keep adding components to your plots by adding the plus sign, but make sure it is at the end of the line. And if you have it at the beginning of the line like this, the code will not work. Then you can always look for help and we will do this during the exercise by typing question mark and the function name. This is how you seek help in R. Um, even sometimes the documentation can be complicated. So scroll down to examples to see how uh, the function works. Um, then look at the error message that you're getting if the code is not working. If you are new to R and actually it doesn't apply if you're new to R, even like I get error messages that I don't understand. And if you don't understand the error messages, just try Googling the error message because there's a very good chance someone else got the same error message and didn't know what it meant. And maybe you will get an answer from Stack Overflow or other R forums. Okay. So let's look at the plot again that you made your first GG plot. Our question was whether engines with uh, bigger engines are less fuel efficient. So if we look at the engine size here and the highway mileage, it does seem like there is an inverse linear relationship by inverse, I mean something, if one thing is going positive, something else is going negative. So the bigger your engine size is, the higher, uh, the lower your mileage is. But there is this group of points here, floating here, which seem to have bigger engine size, uh, you know, five, six, seven, but their highway mileage is not as low. So what is going on here? Um, so, we can't, we don't have any more information from the plot right now. It would be nice if we could see which category these points belong to. So let's see what, how we can do that. So once again, this is your plot. I have written it differently here just so you, it appears sequentially, but remember your ggplot template. That's how we usually, I usually write code. Um, okay. So what happened here? We added another aesthetic. So inside AES, we said, we told ggplot, for color, I want to use the class column. So remember the class column in our MPG data set, it had these categories, um, two seater, compact, midsize, minivan, like all the categories of your car. Um, so by adding um, the color equal to class, now my uh, now I can see the different groups in my data. And let's see, we saw those floating sets, floating cars here, uh, floating points here. What are those uh, that kind of defy this inverse relationship? So most of them are two seaters. So two seaters um, here are sports cars. So this would make sense um the, they are they have bigger size but they also have smaller bodies so uh they have they have a decent mileage so all right so now you know how to add a third aesthetic to your ggplot 
So X and Y are aesthetics, and then you had the color equal to class. Okay. Now, instead of color, I could have added another feature, um, shape. So here what happens, I tell um, ggplot that in, instead of color, um, the shape of my point should depend on class or like map the cl class on shapes of the points. So ggplot then picks shapes and now your cars are, you know, a two-seater car is represented by a circle, black circle, a compact is represented by triangle. Um, but notice what happens here. SUV seem to have disappeared. So we have six groups here and the six groups are represented by shapes, but there's no shape assigned to SUV. Um, the reason this is happening, and so you have to be careful when you assign shape to your group variables is at one time, R will only pick six shapes. And so if you have more than six groups, it will discard. They will not appear on your plot. So just be careful when you're using shape aesthetic. Now, what if I just want to change the look of the plot? I don't need to differentiate um, one group from another. So I just want all my uh, points, to, instead of black boring circles, I want them blue. So now what you will do, so this is setting the properties of your geom point manually. You'll place the color blue outside your aesthetic. Why is that? outside your A's, AES bracket. Because the color equal to blue has nothing to do with the variables. It's just you just changing the overall look of the plot. So if, if there's one thing that you take from this talk and that uh, I hope that you take this and never forget this when you're using ggplot. Inside your AES bracket, only your variable names go. If any feature of the plot doesn't have to do with your variables, and if it's an overall feature, it goes outside. So inside AES, we tell our which variables do we want to show on the plot, okay? All right, so as I said, here the color blue does not convey, convey information about a variable, but only changes the appearance of the plot. So it goes outside of the AES argument in geom point. Um, so just like I specified the color um, manually, I could do some other things also there. You know, um, name of a color as in, so I could say, you know, point uh, color equal to red, yellow, whatever you want. I could have also specified the size of a point in MM. So I could have made the colors bigger or uh, the points bigger or smaller, or I could have specified the shape of a point as a number. So actually R has 25 built-in shapes that are identified by numbers. So say if I wanted a red triangle, I could say um, shape equal to 24. If I wanted a black triangle, I could say shape equal to 17. And the same shape would uh, be assigned to all the points. So we discussed some aesthetics that can be assigned in AES inside your geometry. Um, position, so your X and Y. Um, shape, color, so your, all, all your classes, all different classes of the car were assigned to a different color. There are many more aesthetics that you can use inside ggplot. So one is size, um, so you know, I could say if I have populations of something. I could say this population can be assigned to different sizes. Um, and we have, but remember that aesthetics depend on geometry. So for point, for my point, geom point, all of this made sense. What if I had geom line? So if, what if I had a line plot, plot? I could use line width, line type, line color, so here are some examples of aesthetics that you can use. Um, always remember that they depend on the geometry. 
again, one, what aesthetic you can use with which geometry, we can look it up in the documentation of that geom. Okay. Um, so uh, geometry, so as we have been talking about geometric um, geom point till now, let's look at what other geometries are available and you can work with in ggplot. So this is our original, your first ggplot. This is your uh, original ggplot and this is a different ggplot. They're actually their X and Y axis are the same. So you have displacement and you have highway, but what's different is that they are using different geoms. So this one is using geom point and this one is using something called geo geom smooth. Um, what that does is it looks at the pattern um, a pattern on, in your data and finds the best fit line to represent your data. How do we, how do we do it? So again, how do we plot this? First specify data equal to MPG. And then inside mapping, we are specifying X equal to displacement, just like earlier, Y equal to highway. And here, instead of single line, we are specify, specifying line type equal to drive. So the drive had three cat categories, forward, rear, or four wheel drive. And so your data now is grouped here using the smooth geometry. So instead of se several separate points, um, we have the three trends in these different groups. Now we learned about two different geometries, uh, geom smooth and geom point. Can we use them together in one plot? The answer is yes. And this is how you can do it. So we have our geom layer, geom point layer first. And we specify geom smooth and it, like add all the components with your plus sign. So we have ggplot plus geom point plus geom smooth. Okay. Now there's a lot of, so we have two geometries on the same plot, but if you see on, at the uh, look at the code, there is some redundancy, right? I'm just both bet in between, in, within geom point and within geom smooth, we have exactly the same code, x equal to displacement, y equal to highway. So can we reduce this redundancy? Let's try some other way. Okay, go back. What, I, what have I done here? I have specified the aesthetics X and Y or the mapping within ggplot. What it does is it translates the, so the G, structure of ggplot is hierarchical. What, means, what that means is if you specify the aesthetics in your top layer in ggplot, uh, it translates to the geomes that follow. So geom point will take the X and Y and plot your data. And geom smooth will also take that X and Y and plot the data. You, we can specify additional aesthetics here and we see in a later example how to do that. So basically if you, your X and Y doesn't change through the plot, you can just go ahead and specify that in your ggplot function. And the following geometries will take that. So what happened here? Let's, sorry, let me, went too fast. So once again, we have the X and Y specified within ggplot. And now in the geom point layer, I can specify color equal to class separately. and geom smooth layer just, I haven't specified anything. So the color mapped to class doesn't translate to geom smooth because this is specified in its individual layer. So the geometries don't talk to each other. Um, so if I need, need these lines by color, um, then I have to specify separately here, color equal to class or 
mention color equal to class within the main ggplot. So if I mentioned color equal to class in ggplot, then it would translate both to geom point and to geom smooth. But here we are only specifying, we only want the color mapping on the points and not the line. So we have done that within that particular layer. Now, um, so this is just a reminder of what I spoke before. Um, where to place your AES, where to place your mapping. Um, if it is placed inside ggplot function, the same AES is used for all layers. It translates to all layers. If AES is placed outside of ggplot function, then it is, its definition is used for that specific layer. Of course, you can define multiple AES like we did for the color equal to class for multiple geometries within the same plot. Okay, so you think this is the last example for multiple geometries and then we could go to exercises. So once again, we are uh, specifying X and Y within ggplot. So it should translate to the following layers. And we have color equal to class for geom point. And we have geom smooth. Geom smooth here looks different because we are not using the same data as here. We have filtered the data further. So here we have used, um, you don't need to know filter and S equal to false for now. Just know that what we are doing here is we are using a subset of the data. So only class if your class is SUV. So let's see which is SUV, those are the pink points. So only if your class is SUV, a, geom, a smooth, smoothing line will be drawn through that. So we are telling ggplot that for the geom smooth line, we don't want to use the entire data set. We just want to use a subset of data set, which is all the cars that are SUV. And you can, this is how you can do that. So you can define a different geom for a different layer. You can, um, sorry, a different mapping for a different layer. And you can also define a different subset of the data for the layer. Okay. Right. So let's move to exercises. Um, and after the exercise, we can take a few minutes break. I'm switching to my our window. All right. So if you go to my GitHub repo, I think um, Dr. Harris posted that uh, link before you can um, download the exercises file and work through them on your own. Um, right now I will work through them in front of you. So you'll see me live coding, but I don't actually, this is my first time live coding. So forgive me if I stumble. I'll try to not, try not to waste your time. All right. So this is ex exercise. exercise. Um, I have borrowed these exercises from R4 Data Science book and uh, Thomas Peder Pedersen's workshop on ggplot2, which is available on YouTube. And it's a great resource. Okay, let's see if I can zoom in the code. Is this better? No, uh, Let's see if I can make it bigger, right? Okay. All right, so we'll scroll through this slowly. Um, so these are borrowed exercises and you can go to the source here uh, to dive in um, further. This document is, uh, uh, is an R markdown document. So if I, basically it contains the code and the output. And if I hit the knit button after we are done, it will produce a single document which will have your code and um, output. 
So these are the packages we need today. Um, I'm just going to, um, we are going to load these packages here using the library commands. And if it's throwing an error, just to install packages and install the package first. Okay, so let me run that. Libraries are loaded. All right, so we, uh, I'll go through some examples uh, similar to what we had in the presentation. So we will explore the uh, MPG data set and make a few basic plots. This data set contains a subset of the fuel economy data that EPA makes available on this website. It contains only models which had a new release every year between 99 and 2008. And this is also used as a proxy for popularity of the cars. This data frame has 234 rows and 11 variables. So actually just look, let's look at the data set. All right. So this is what we had on the slide. Do head MPG, you just look at the first six rows. Okay, so here we have the displacement and here we have the highway mileage, which is what we'll be using mostly. Okay, and if you look at the top of the table, you can see whether your variable is a character, double, integer, so you can look at all those features. All right, so you have seen this code before. I'll just, okay, I have a question. How did you get this table really quick? So I'll just do that again. You just do head and BG. That's, if you do head of any data frame, you can see the first six rows. Um, I'm sorry if I'm not able to answer all your questions on the chat because we have limited time. So I'll try to, my goal is to try to work through these exercises while we are online in the workshop. Okay. Um, so we can, this we can ignore for now. If for some reason your data is not loading, you can do this. Uh, just remind R that that is what you, where you're looking for a built-in data set. And we are going to draw, draw basic scatter plot. So uh, within your ggplot, you have data equal to MPG, mapping equal to AES, X equal to displacement, Y equal to highway plus G on point. Um, so uh, like we said, we can do mapping this way where you have the aest uh, aesthetics within ggplot or mapping can be given both as global or per layer as well. So instead of it specifying in ggplot, I have it here in geom point. You run that, you get the same plot. Okay. So both the commands give me the same plot. It doesn't matter where I put the mapping right now. Now, again, a reminder, if an aesthetic is linked to data, it is put inside the AES. So, and if we want it, um, yeah, so let's run this. So we are running this color, giving, giving the aesthetic color equal to class. We get the same plot, which you've seen in the presentation. And then can we color a subset of the data? What if we are interested in only the, remember our floating um, cars that were uh, two-seater sports cars? What if I'm interested in only coloring those cars? I can do that like this. Again, within geom point. I specify color equal to class if class is equal to two-seater. So you run that, 
what you have is here. So what happened? Basically, it used it used that logical used that logic, and if the and um, colored this subset differently, and the rest of the colors are the same. So your two-seater class cars are now blue or green. Okay. Now. If you simply want to set a color to a single value, place it outside of AES. So remember, if I wanted to just have all my dots instead of black, a different color, I'm placing it outside of AES because it doesn't, doesn't refer to any variable in the data, right? So get all, I have all purple dots now. Some geomes only need a single map in, mapping and will calculate the rest for you. So say, um, so far we just, we have done a geome smooth and geome point. Now we have a new geome histogram. So I just want to look at the distribution of highway mileage. So in histogram, we don't have to specify both X and Y axis. I can just specify the X and uh, it will, histogram will do the rest. So, okay. And there is this count on histogram. So this is related to stats. We will cover that later. How does it do it? Okay. So exercise here. Yeah. Modify the code below to make the points larger triangles and slightly transparent. See geom point help for more information on the point layer. All right. So let's see how do we do that. So there's a hint. Transparency is controlled with alpha and shape is controlled with shape. Think about if the geometric features need to be inside or outside AES. So here we are we just want to change the overall look of all points. We just want to make all circles into larger triangles. So we will place it outside AES. Let's run the code as is what happens. Okay, this is our usual ggplot. Um, what say? points, larger triangles. Okay, so first I should shape. I think the triangle was 17 number and transparent. So alpha, when you said transparency, is between zero and one. And zero is completely transparent and one is completely opaque. So I'm just gonna set it to 0.5 and it also says larger triangles. So I don't know what the current size is. I'm gonna say size two, let's see. Okay, so we have triangles. They are slightly transparent, but they are not necessarily, I don't know if they're larger. Let's just change it to four. Okay, there you go. And we also wanted to look at the help. So let's look at point. So I'm pulling out the help, just expanding this so you can see. So when you're looking at the help, you know, this is what, what all can you specify in geom point? What can you change? That is within, you know, you can see this here or you can, and you can see the details of the arguments. So, you know, you can set mapping, you can set data, you can set stat. We'll look at stat more. 
And these are the aesthetics you can specify. So we have done X, Y, alpha is transparency, color, fill. So I could you know, fill the triangles with a different color. Uh, we can make them red, purple, group, shape, size. Okay. Right. What is next? Okay, this is the last exercise and we'll take a break. Um, using the MPG data set, draw a line chart, a box plot, and a histogram. Okay, so let's see how to do that. Uh, okay, first, do the chunk. If you used R markdown, I'm just using a shortcut option command and I to include uh, introduce a new chunk here. Uh, you don't need to know this for the exercise at all. Um, I've specified the data and then I want line chart. So let's see, is there a geom line? Okay, there is a geom line. And I will say S equal to placement y equal to Anyway, all right. So, okay. It's an ugly chart, but it's a line chart. So, all right. I'm going to use same here. Let's see, we have box plot. Okay, there is a geom box plot. And then let me try, see if there's a geom histogram. Okay, so there's a geom histogram. Um, for histogram, okay, let's see. All right, so I have my line plot and I have the box plot, but I'm getting some weird Error. Okay, so the box plot. Remember, I could, I've specified a continuous um, variable here. So maybe what I need to do is let's do the box plot by class. So that doesn't look funny. And for histogram, again, I just needed one. Uh, I just needed one um, axis. So. Let's change that, right? You can tell I'm live coding for the first time. All right, okay, so looks like we have something. All right, so that's your box plot where you, you have summary of each class and we have a histogram. All right, so stat, this reminds me that I have to go back to the slides now. That's it for exercises for now. We'll come back to them again. Um, right, so is it okay if we take a Five minutes break. Look at the chat. Okay, great. So it's um, so let's come back in five minutes, and if you're ready, just type ready in the chat. So I know that most of you are ready. I'll also go have some water and come back in five minutes. Thank you.
Okay, if you are ready and bad, just type ready in the chat. Okay, I have a few responses, so I'll take that as a signal to go ahead. Okay. So now we just dis we discussed uh, data mapping geometries. Now we'll talk about statistics. And this the goal here in this talk is just to introduce you to capabilities of ggplot. If this is something that you have not done, or you know, find it confusing. It's, we all are on the same boat. I think. I I think, and many others feel that stats in ggplot is probably one of the more complicated things. So you know, don't worry about it. My goal here is to just show you a few things that if you um, if you can use them, great. But next time you see them, you know, uh, hopefully it will, it will strike you as familiar. So. Okay, so um, statistical transformations are all linked to geometries. And every geome has a default stat and vice versa. Um, so since they are in, uh, they have a default stat and stat has a default geome, you can actually use instead of you know geome point, you can probably use a stat uh, or geome bar, you can use a um, corresponding stat, but former is more common. Using geome is more common. So um, say we have this, um, here we, uh, I'm showing a different data set called diamonds from within your package. It uh, just, it, it has data of cut and clarity of 50,000 or several thousand diamonds in the data set. Um, so we have a new geome here. We have geome bar um, and we have specified the mapping as X equal to cut. So the cut type, fair, good, very good, premium, ideal. So there are these different cut types of the diamond. These are these different groups on the X axis. So when I do that, uh, this is the output I got, I get. I haven't specified the Y axis, but still ggplot shows me a Y axis as count. So where does the count on Y axis come from? This is what statistical transformation is, where I am not providing the data, all the data, ggplot is doing some computation on its own because of uh, depending on the geometry. And um, that's what we are seeing on the plot. So um, some plots calculate new, new value from the data, which is what statistical transformation is. Um, for example, bar charts and histograms we saw earlier. We also saw, saw smoothing function, uh, line geome smooth, which uses, um, which predicts, um, estimates the best fit on its own. Um, we also looked at box plots. So your summary statistics are shown in the box plot, which is computation that ggplot does on its own. The algorithm that is used to calculate a new value for a graph, for example, count here, is called a stat. So that's where the stat comes from, short for statistical transformation. What is actually happening under the hood here? So here is a representation of that. For example, in our diamonds data set, this is um, you know a snapshot of the data set, um, carrot type of cut, color, clarity, depth, price. So this is the data set that ggplot has. It transforms the data with the count stat, which count stat, which means the count algorithm, which returns a data set of cut values and counts. So it applies the stat count algorithm on its own um, because we asked for the bar plot geometry and this is like its interim data, data set, data frame that it generates. 
this is happening under the hood. So we don't see it. What we see it, we see is the output. So here it calculated how many diamonds are in the fair category. That is the count. How many diamonds are in the good cat category. So most of diamonds are in very good or premium category. And now it uses the count data to plot the geom bar. So we have the count on the y-axis and the cut on the x-axis. You can find out which stat each geom uses by look, looking at the default value of stat argument in the help page. And um, so I've written this question, what is the default stat for geom bar? But we'll go through it in the exercises. Um, we'll look up geom bar documentation and see what's the default. Um, now, sometimes you may want to override the default options. For example, if instead of count on the y-axis, I want proportion. What proportion of all the data, of all the diamonds are fair or good? Um, so knowing, knowing what stat it uses, uh, a geome uses, helps us customize it. So for example, here I've used again geome bar. A is x equal to cut, and I can specify y equal to stat prop. So this is now, now ggplot knows that instead of the default count, I want proportions. And uh, note that there is this group equal to one, which I've specified here. We'll talk about it in the exercise. Why do we need it? What happens if you don't do this? So since we're talking about bar charts, there is something called position adjustments, which is relevant if you are into, if this is something that you do um, and you use ggplot to um, plot bar charts. So we, the next few slides are about that. Um, so I have modified the code here. Again, ggplot data equal to diamonds, mapping in geom bar x equal to cut, and I've specified color equal to cut. When I specify color equal to cut, it really doesn't, what has changed here? It's really just changing the outline of the bar. So that's not very useful at all because I can hardly see it. Um, what instead of color we have to use something similar is fill. So fill equal to cut actually fills. So these geometries which have more of a shape, fillable shape, I guess. Uh, you can, um, color will, pro will just do the outline. So you have to specify fill if you want to change the color of the entire geometry, the entire shape. So we specify, sp specify fill equal to cut. But if you just look at the plot, we don't really need a different color for every bar, right? Because we already know fair is this bar, good is this bar, uh, very good is this bar. I don't actually need additional aesthetic for that. So another use of the fill is uh, what I could do is I could subcategorize these bars, fill equal to clarity. Now what happens, and, um, each bar shows you further divisions of groups. So our diamonds are classified by cut and also clarity. So what, what does this show you? So for example, you have the VS2 clarity. So in the ideal um, cut, that's like the, your maximum diamonds out of this clarity. So I'm not, we're not doing like making great conclusions from these plots, but I just want to use these examples to show you what we can do. Okay. Um, now, if you're using your bar plot like this, there are a few options that you can use. Um, something called an argument called position. So remember we talked about position adjustments. Um, so there are three options, position equal to identity, dodge and fill, and we'll go through them one by one. Um, so position equal to, if you specify position equal to identity, um, everything is 
uh, object is placed exactly where it falls in the context of the graph. This won't, this doesn't make much sense right now, but if you see the other options, maybe it will. Um, it is useful if the bars are made transparent because otherwise you'll just have overlapping things on top of each other. Um, so position equal to identity means just as is from the data. Just place things right there. If I do position equal to fill, what happens it? It makes each set of stacked bars the same height. So this is useful for comparing proportions across groups. So if I want to say, you know, this IF is a category, um, which, which group has the least proportion of least percentage of IF categories. So I can just look at directly compare the groups and say, okay, the fair has the least at least uh, IF category of diamonds. Okay. And the third option, option is position equal to dodge. So it's like dodge the main bar and sit next to it. So it places objects next to each other and it is useful for comparing individual values. How do you specify? You just specify position equal to dodge. There is another position argument which is useful for scatter plots, and we'll see it in our examples or in the slides soon. Okay. But that's it with the positioning. Let's go to scales. So um, we talked about scales earlier and you're probably familiar with it, but everything inside that goes inside your aesthetic will have a scale by default. You don't have to specify it. For example, when we use the colors to define class, ggplot just picked a color scale, but you can also, um, so there's a default, but the power of ggplot is that you can customize all of this. So all the scale uh, function names follow a typical style. So they are scale, aesthetic, and type. So I can have, you know, scale X type could be continuous. So type can be generic, continuous, discrete, or bend, or specific, for example, area for scaling size to circle area. So we'll, we'll see some examples and then hopefully it will be more clear. So we have seen this plot before. Um, we, um, we have ggplot mpg and x equal to displacement, y equal to equal to class. We didn't specify the color scale, but ggplot picked its own color scale. What if we wanted to pick something? We can do that. So there is a scale color brewer that you can use. So it has it has a the um, set of palettes that are sensible as in it, um, you have different choices to choose from depending on your data. Um, here I have chosen type equal to qual, qual stands for qualitative. That means I have categ categorical data. So don't pick a sequential scale where something is going from light to dark because that won't make sense. It's different categories. So uh, you can look up the, I think we have in the exercise to look up the documentation and see what options are available. So we can also change X and Y scales and the features. So here we are changing, um, our X is a continuous scale and we are defining the breaks. So where do the tick marks come? So three uh, instead of, here we had two to seven. Here we are specifying three, five, six, breaks equal to three, five, six. And that's what it shows here in the plot. Um, scale Y continuous, we can transform, we just transform it to, it to a log scale. And that's what it shows here. Okay, next is facets. Um, so facets split data into multiple panels. Um, and this is another way to add an additional variable in your plot. It is useful for categorical variables. You can facet by a single variable using facet wrap. 
and facet by two variables using facet grid. So just if you're using facets, just remember the two names, facet wrap and facet grid. Let's look at an example. So we have this, our old friend, our first ggplot. All right now, all the data is plotted here. What if we wanted to divide it by class? See what happened. So I just used facet wrap. This is the this is the for a syntax. You use a tilde and whatever group you want to use it. Uh, divide your subset your data by. Um, you use that. And I've specified n row equal to two so that the facets fall within two rows and don't go beyond it um, or in a single um, a single line. Um, okay. So what what this does is that now instead of a single big plot, you can now look at uh, relationships within each class size. So you don't have to specify the scale or uh, behavior of the scales. ggplot automatically shares the y, y, uh, x and y scales. So it doesn't, um, which makes sense. You don't need to use the y axis again and again for each panel because you have it once here. And the same is for x axis. But you can change these features also. ggplot just makes it easier to have a usable default. Okay. Now, what if we wanted to facet around two variables? So we can do that using facet grid. So here we have two categorical variables, the drive and the cycle, and the ggplot just did that. So you have drive here, four, four wheeler, forward rear, and the cycle is four, five, six, eight. Once again, you didn't have to specify the behavior of the scale, it just automatically shares the uh, panel title and the scales among all the subplots. All right, so good, we have running behind a little. So we will go through exercises now. Right. Okay, so let me hide this. Hide floating meeting controls, okay. Every geome has a stat. Um, this is why new data can appear when we use geom bar new data like the current. Um, so this is the same plot that we had um, for the geom bar. I'm just running it so we can look at it again. You have different classes on the x-axis and the count that ggplot automatically calculates. So the stat can be overwritten. If we have pre-computed count, we don't want any additional computations to perform. And we use the identity stat to leave the data alone. Um, so if you already have count in your data and you don't want to ggplot to again compute it, you just want to use that. Um, we use specify stat equal to identity, like right? just use what I have in my data, don't try to compute it on your own. That's what I'm telling um, ggplot. Um, so don't worry about this here, just know that um, I have used this code to um, make, to um, count, ha have a count variable, and I'm just asking ggstat to use it directly. Um, so I've just specified stat equal to identity and then it uses whatever count I had. I'm sorry if I'm going through them fast, I'll try to add more um, documentation to it. So if you're referring to it later, you can um, follow the exercises on your own. Um, so most obvious geom plus stat combinations have a dedicated geom constructor. The one above is available directly as geom column. So many geom and stat users are obvious. Um, so ggplot has a default 
um, um, those direct functions that you can use. So instead of using start equal to identity in the earlier function, I could have just used geom column. Okay, so run it. And it's again, so geom column doesn't compute anything on its own. It just uses your what computation you, you did. Now I can also uh, calculate my own uh, functions within stat and ask ggplot to reproduce that. So values calculated by the stat is available with after stat function inside EES, and you can do all sorts of computation inside that. So for example, um, I'm using geom bar here, same x equal to class. And what I want on y is percentage. So I'm just you know, using a simple formula to calculate percentage, 100 into count by sum of the count, just total. Okay. So on y-axis now it has whatever I computed. So there's a lot you can do and customize if you want to. Exercise, what does geom column do? How is it different from geom bar? So we just look, saw that geom column takes your uh, whatever computation is already there and geom bar will actually compute it for you. Okay. We learned that geom and stat are interchangeable. Can you look at geom bar documentation and figure out which stat it uses as default? Modify the code below to use that stat directly instead. All right, so just let's see, let's look at geom bar. All right, so if you can see on the help documentation here. There are two types of bar charts, geom bar and geom call. Geom bar makes the height of the bar proportional to the number of the cases in each group. We saw that. Um, if you want the heights of the bars to represent values in the data, use geom call instead. So that's the answer to our first question. Now, geom bar uses stat count by default. It counts the number of cases at each exposition. Um, so that's our answer. So it uses stat count by default. So instead of geom bar, we could, let's try to use stat count directly and see what happens. So this is geom bar, I'm running this. And then what if I do stat count? Why should it work? It should work because these two are interchangeable and using geom is just more popular. Okay, so that confirms it works the same way. Okay, um, we have used stat summary to add a red dot at the mean highway for each groups. So what do we have here? We have, G we have a new geom here, geom jitter. Let's look up what it means. So geom jitter is a shortcut for geom point position equal to jitter. So remember we were talking about positions and I said there is a position for uh, point, um, geom point that is useful. And this is that position equal to jitter. It adds a small amount of random variation to the location of each point and is a use useful way of handling over plotting. Uh, what that means is sometimes in your scatter plot, you have points that are right on top of each other. And so you don't see them because they are just in a grid form of structure. So you can use position equal to um, jitter in geom point, or you can use geom jitter directly to actually see how your points add some random noise and just like disassociate these points that are clumped together. Um, so that's what this new geom is. 
Um, okay. And we have x equal to class, y equal to highway. Okay. All right. So, so because of the jitter, the points are a little randomly distributed, but you can see uh, this is more useful than them being at, you know, clumped together and appearing as a single point. So what is the assignment? To add a red dot at the mean highway for each group using stats summary. So let's add stats summary. And then I think the function is mean equal to red. Does it do it? Missing aesthetics x and y. Okay. S equal to y equal to highway. Let's see if it works. All right. This point is too big. So let me just change that to y is equal to two. Oh, no. And five. Okay, maybe point two. Okay, there we go. So why did I need a AES a mapping again here? This is because we didn't have this mapping here at ggplot. So geom jitter didn't talk to stat summary and didn't tell, hey, x is this, y is this. So just remember that. Okay. Okay. So in our proportional bar chart, we need to set group equal to one, why? So remember we, uh, we saw that, uh, we, I had to set group equal to one. In other words, what is the problem with these two graphs? So in the following two graphs, we have not set, set group equal to one. What happens? Let's see. Oh, okay. So this does not look right because the is showing proportion one. So what happens if you don't specify group equal to one? It's, I don't know why it is in built like this, but ggplot thinks that each group is, um, is just that. So it's gonna, just going to calculate the proportion within that group. So it's just saying, okay, fair is full of fair and good is full of good. That's why I have to specify all of this is group equal to one, like it's one group. So now calculate the proportion accordingly. So I'm just going to say here, mapping. let's see that changes it. No. Anyone know what I'm doing wrong? Okay, it has to be. Okay, it had to be within the aesthetic. All right, so this looks much better. I'm gonna skip the second exercise right now because I think we're running short of time, but I will add the solutions to the, so if you check back later to the, during the day or, um, you know, after 12 hours, you can see the solution. Um, what is the problem with this plot? How could we improve it? Okay, so let's see what is this plot. Okay, so it seems like we had, remember we had 234 po points, but I don't see 234 points here. And it is, we have a categorical variable here, like, um, 
no, I'm sorry. We have the continuous variable here, but it seems that many points are overlapping. And so we don't see all the points. So remember, we could use position equal to jitter. So if you see this kind of pattern in your scatter plot, you know, your points are vertically or horizontally aligned instead of random, this, you know, uh, you could use, see if position equal to jitter helps in just visualizing where load of your, most of your data is. So I'll just did jitter, that looks a bit better. Okay. Right. Scales. Scales define how the mapping you specify inside aesthetic should happen. All mappings have an associated scale, even if not specified. So it's just the default that ggplot uses. Okay. So yeah, so this is what we've seen before. We can customize it. Um, this is what we did in our presentation. Um, add a scale color brewer, type equal to qualitative. And pick another nice scale to represent your data. Similarly position. So this is, again, this is the same example from your plots, from your presentation. So I'm just going to run it. You can see the your breaks have changed and this is a log, log transformed y-axis now. Okay, let's quickly go through this example. Um, so use our color brewer display brewer all to see all the different palettes from color brewer and pick your favorite, modify the code below to use it. All right, so this color brewer is a package that has these very ni nice usable palettes. When I say nice and usable, what I mean is that when you're trying to pick colors, you don't want to mislead the audience by picking one color that stands out. You want, if it's just like class of cars, you want colors that are different, but still not one color jumps out at you more than other colors. So, because if that happens then you're just misleading or drawing attention to something that you don't need to using the data. So let's run this. Oh, that's not readable at all. Let me zoom it. Um, okay, so these are all the uh, color palettes in your um, Color brew available in Color Brewer. Um, so you have these spectral, uh, the, these uh, there are these different sets. This first set that you see is you know going from light to dark. So if you have some sequential gradation, you may want to use that. The second set is probably what we need, where each color is like distinct, and there's no particular trend. Um, and the third set is diverging. So you know it. Uh, converging. So you have dark to light and then converging to light and then to dark again. So again, this will be more useful if you have sequential or quantitative data. So let's pick something from here. Uh, I'm going to just use, um, let's do dark too. Okay. You can just pick anything you want and, and see. Sometimes it forgets. Okay, there you go. All right, so it's just, it's a different path that I picked and you can do that with your data as well. Okay, modify the code below to create a bubble chart with size mapped to a continuous variable showing cycle with size. Make sure that only the present amount of cylinders, four, five, six, and eight are present in the legend. Okay, so, all right. Mm. 
Oh, sorry. I think I showed the solution. Uh, okay, so I have cycle to size already. Only the present amount of cylinders are the legend. Okay, so let's see. What does that mean? So I have the bubble shows um, in um, your cycle. Uh, so I have an additional variable now on, in the plot, which is cycle. And depending on the size, um, the size is mapped to the cycle now. So lower cycle is four is smaller dots and cycle is eight is bigger dots. But there's also seven here. This is an automatic scale that R has assigned, um, which is not, there is no cycle seven in our data set. So what it's asking is, can you change it so that uh, we can remove it? So let's see, scale size. I was missing this breaks. How to define breaks equal to combine four, five, six, eight. So I'm manu manually defining that. Hey, just keep limit the breaks to these values. All right, so this is four, five, six, eight. So that's how you can do this. I have more exercises here, but we are running out of time. So I'm just going to skip that. I'm sorry, but I'll include all of that in the solution so you can um, do it after the workshop. Just check back after 12 hours because I want, I want to add additional notes to these. Um, so, okay. all right. So um, coordinates. So coordinates is most of the times if you're not dealing with spatial or polar data, you don't have to worry about it. Um, yeah. Um, basically, you're telling by specifying coordinate system, how should X and Y be interpreted? And default is the Cartesian coordinate system. It's very useful for spatial data, knowing about the coordinate system if you're making maps and stuff. Okay, um, so we'll go through one example. We have um, now we have um, we have the same highway on x-axis and class on um, no sorry highway on y-axis and class on x-axis and we are drawing a box plot. What happens if we play around with the coordinate? So I'm going to say coord flip. Um, so what did that do? It basically flipped, uh, moved the y-axis to x-axis and vice versa. And sometimes it is easy. This, I prefer this if you have, like these names are very long and they're getting crowded here or if you have uh, incremental changes or very small changes between the groups and it's some easier to see if they are laid out horizontally. So quad flip is useful for that. Um, we can also, um, so this is the same similar plot. We have used geom point and position equal to jitter. That's just another example of using position jitter. What happens if you use polar coordinates? It can really lead to some dramatic results. We don't need it here, but I'm just trying, showing you um, what you can do. Um, so in co polar coordinates, X and Y axis are um, interpreted as radius and angle. So that's what, and you can tweak things around it in it um, as well. So themes. So theme is finally what dictates how your plot canvas is going to look like. These are style changes that are not related to data. So these are just 
you know, if I, if you will, cosmetic changes. It, uh, it, you can apply built-in themes or modify each element of your plot separately. And it follows a hierarchy. So it changes in, um, in the upper level will percolate to lower levels. So for example, you know, in this plot, this is our same highway displacement plot. I have applied, and you can add this again using a plus sign. I have add, added theme classic. So these are some built-in themes in ggplot. I can change it to minimal. Um, so what does minimal do? Just removes those X and Y bars and it's just really minimalistic. Change it to dark. So this is what happens. So there are built-in themes that you can apply and it will quickly change. Just with one function, it will change overall look of your plot. You can also tweak each and every component of the theme. And you can really go crazy. So, so this is just an example to show you what all you can do. So see, this is the same plot. And I have theme and I have just this list of things that I've changed. And you can really spend a lot of time on this if you are really particular about what your plot looks like. So just uh, look up the theme uh, help and just see, I think there are 20, 30 things that you can tweak or even, even more. Um, I have this in exercises, but we won't go through that right now because we are running out of time. Um, so that's, that's it with the components of ggplot. And I some things that I've not covered, I'll just quickly show you how to do it. How to add labels to your plot. So, you know, just, okay, this is a plot that you know already. I have theme minimal, and this is, I'm now adding labels using labs. So you can just do X label, Y label, it's very simple, title, subtitle, caption, caption goes here. Um, another thing in ggplot is so far we have been just adding stuff one over other. Ggplot can, your plot can be saved as an object and then you can use it object to add plus, plus, plus and more layers to it. So I just wanted to show a quick example of that. So here I've assigned ggplot to an object called my plot. Okay. Nothing will show unless you type my plot first. So now my plot is, object is showing and now I'm gonna add the labels to this. Okay, so you can you do this with anything like just save part of your plot as my plot and then just add plus plus plus. So it just makes it more flexible to save and use your plots later. Okay. So we're going to skip this exercise right now so I can cover all my slides. Um, and this is just quick review of uh, now your final ggplot template. So you have your data, you have your geo function. Within that, you have mapping, stats, position, coordinate function, and facet function. And as I have said earlier, in practice, you rarely need to supply all seven parameters to make a graph because ggplot2 will provide useful defaults for everything except the data, mapping, and geo function, which is necessary for you to supply to make your minimum ggplot. Um, So I'm gonna skip these slides. Um, yes, I wanted to spend some time on extensions that are beyond ggplot. So there are many packages that come that are like helper packages for ggplot that you can use to improve your plots. And I wanted to talk about some of those. Okay. Um, so this is very useful. It's called a patchwork package. It combines different types of plots in a single layout. So you just uh, install packages like this, patchwork package, remember that. Um, how does it work? So here is an example. Um, so I have plot P1. Remember, you can save your ggplot as an object. So I have this first plot P1, and I have the second plot, which is a box plot P2. And all I did was P1 plus P2. And ggplot just figures all those other th things out, the sizes, proportions, you know, so they will look neat together. You can also make more complicated layouts. So for example, here I have two more plots, P3, which is this geom smooth plot, 
and P4 with this geom bar plot. And just with a simple command, like where I specify P1 next to P2 next to P3 and all of them above P4. And using patchwork, you can, it just, just the patchwork package arranges everything neatly here. So this is very useful. Remember, this is different from facets. In facets, you have the same plot type. So it's my scatter plot divided by in groups um, or my box plot divided in groups. But using patchwork, you can actually combine different kinds of plots and it really can help you tell a story from your data. Okay, right. Um, so quickly plot annotation. What does annotation mean? You can write comments on your plot to tell, uh, again, a story or label your plots. And the two useful packages are, there are many packages. These are two that I'm showing you here that are quick and easy to use. ggforce and ggrepel. Um, so this is an ugly plot. And this is, uh, I have gone through this several times before I knew G about ggrepel. So what I've done here is plotted first 20 rows of your data. Um, and what I wanted was to label every point, every car with the model name. And if I try to just use the default geom text, this is what happens. Um, and, but with ggrepel, you can use ggrepel and you can read this code later. Uh, it repels, literally repels all your text and places it in such a way that you can see them one after another. Um, and now remember we were talking annotation, we were talking about these two car, these cars, these special cars that have large engines but small bodies. And so there's some commentary on the data which you would like your audience to see. Um, so what, there are two things here that you are doing. You are uh, placing a shape around a subset of your data and you are adding text and you can do this with ggforce. So the function I've used here is geomark ellipse. So it's drawing an elliptical shape. You can do squares, circles, and I think there are many shapes you can explore. And inside the aesthetics, you specify which subset of data you want to encompass and uh, then the text there. So that's pretty easy to use. Um, that's it for this new information or the teaching that I had to do. Sorry, that took so much time. Um, quick references, what next? What, uh, so it, these, all these links on my slides, you can click on them and go follow them. Um, what I showed and um, the GG4, GG Repel and um, mm, Patchwork, they are all ggplot extensions and there are many more extensions that you can uh, look up. So follow that link for that. R Studio Cheat Sheet, so this is um, like, Cliff notes. Um, many packages of our studio have these cheat sheets where all of the stuff about ggplot is in like two pages. You can print that out and you can look it up. Maybe you already use it for other things. I use it a lot. And uh, more exciting stuff. So if you follow this cookbook for our, uh, if you go on this link, how BBC uses R to make their plots, their cool plots. You can see their code here. Um, and um, if you're not follow, following Tidy Tuesday project, please follow Tidy Tuesday project. It's uh, uh, um, some new open data sets are released every week and people share their course on how they're treating, um, how they're using that to plot and tell stories. Um, so follow Tidy Tuesday on t Twitter and the screen cards from, uh, screencasts from David Robinson are very useful. Um, so. These are the resources that I used for making these slides. So thanks to all of these people. Um, and thank you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for staying with me. I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much, Meenakshi. That was amazing. Um, I learned so much and I've been using ggplot for years. So uh, I think we're getting the echoes in the chat and um, I don't know if anyone has any questions, but we're one minute from 9.30. Uh, excellent timing. Yeah, I'm sorry I had to rush through the exercises, but I promise if you check it after a day over the weekend, 
I'll have the solutions uploaded. So if you were following them, you can follow them further and actually complete them. Great. Yeah, I'm putting the um, GitHub repository link one more time in the chat for those of you who are interested. And I will um, send that out again via the meetup for this uh, particular event. So if you don't get it now, you can get it there. And I just wanna thank our instructor again. That was uh, really, really great. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, everyone. All right. I'm going to end. The recording will be on our um, Our Lady St. Louis YouTube, and I will tweet that out within the next couple of days. I have to wait for it to kind of render, and then I'll post it and, and tweet it out. So if you follow us on Twitter, you'll get it there. Um, if you don't see it there or you want to, you can always email um, Our Lady's STL at Gmail, and we can send it to you. All right, cool. I think.